Hi, everyone. Uh, today we're meeting in the virtual world, but I would like to acknowledge that the Art Gallery of Ontario operates on land that is the territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga Nation and was also the territory of the Wendat and Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. I'm incredibly grateful that we can connect today to share about how museums can support well-being and our communities. I'm going to start by introducing us just so you have an idea of who we are and what we're going to talk about. So Dr. Chatterjee is a professor of biology specializing in genetics, evolution, and environment. She trained as a zoologist with a PhD in primatology. She has worked at the University College London's Grant Museum of Zoology and directed the UCL museums. In particular, her research involves object-based learning and the value of museums to health and well-being. She co-founded the National Alliance for Museums, Health and Well-Being with colleagues from the National Museums Liverpool, which is now the Culture, Health and Well-Being Alliance. So a great person to talk to us about um, health and museums. Who am I? I am the Assistant Curator of Community Programs, which means that I work to lower any perceived or physical barriers to the AGO collections. So this looks like facilitated guided experiences, such as our multi-sensory tour designed for blind and vision impaired communities, co-created peer-to-peer supported programs exemplified by our partnership with the South Riverdale Community Health Center, and more recently participating in a provincial pilot for prescriptions to art or social prescribing with the Alliance for Healthier Communities, just to name a few examples. And we're meeting today to discuss, and I borrowed this from Dr. Chatterjee's website, the biopsychosocial benefits of culture, including the work of museums and galleries in enhancing quality of life, physical and mental health, well-being, and social inclusion. So basically, how museums are social determinants of health. So welcome, Helen, and thank you for chatting with us today. I thank am, you. go ahead. Thank you for having me, it's wonderful to be here. Yeah, it's great. And I'm actually just gonna launch in because I can't wait to hear um, your thoughts, but can you describe your work around health and well-being in the context of museums? Sure. Well, it is is really wonderful to be here and I've, I've, we've obviously had a great chat earlier and I've been reading about the wonderful work you've done and it sounds like you already have some great practice that you've been working on. And the sorts of work we've been doing, I guess, over about 15 years now, when I first got involved, when I was running our University Zoology Museum, was really around what value museums, their collections, their spaces and their people, which are all part of, I guess, those what I would call cultural assets, what value they can have to people and the communities that they operate in. Uh, and the way that we first went about that was, I guess, trying to understand what aspects of museums and museum programming can support different aspects of health and wellbeing. And we've done that through different routes, largely by working with communities that were not really engaged in museums. So those people who were excluded from museums by virtue of their health or particular aspects of their socioeconomic status. That means that they are not active, if you like, visitors or consumers of, of museums or arts or culture. And the way that we've done that is through health and social care partners, but working particularly with different sorts of groups who might be considered marginalized. So that could be people in hospital experiencing particular, particular health conditions. So people with cancer, for example, right through to people who've got long-term complex conditions like stroke survivors, uh, people with different forms of dementias, but also communities like refugees and asylum seekers. So I guess cohorts of people who, like I say, are not typical regular museum goers um, and or might be excluded from that due to a particular physical or psychological condition. And I guess our research is really focused on what museums can do to support those sorts of communities but also wanting to understand what it is about our unique attributes in museums, what it is about our collections, our spaces and, and wonderful staff like yourselves who can contribute to supporting what I would call community public health. And that's really been, I guess, my real driver coming from my role as a museum curator and an academic was really trying to understand how museums can um, better articulate themselves as a cultural value asset. 
and a lot of our researchers focus very much on participant engagement with the sorts of stuff that people have been doing in museums, I guess, for a long time, but perhaps not thought about it in the context of looking for outcomes that might improve somebody's physical or psychological health. So we've looked very much at different aspects of programmes. You mentioned object based learning, so how people engage with collections through particular activities. It might be arts and crafts. It might be, for example, um, the way that they're operating in a space, having a tour or a talk. Uh, and the sorts of programmes we've looked at have been looking at combinations of different sorts of activities that can be used to stimulate both cognitively through the brain, um, but also emotionally, so activities that they find enjoyable, um, but also physically, so getting people moving around spaces. And really crucial to all of that, I guess, has been two things, the social element and understanding what aspect of that engagement is important and the key feature of sociality has come out of that. And also a really important creative element and lots of participants that we've talked to with the many thousands of different participants we've worked with that that aspect of creativity within a social context has really come through about what it is that museums can offer to communities. Yeah, it's so interesting, right, because we often think of culture as being so separate from care and well being and that's certainly something that comes uh, through to me when I think about the experiences that I've had with participants on our programming. Um, one example, for instance, is just having caregivers come with participants in a program for um, Alzheimer's and dementia, so our in the moment program. And there's an opportunity then to have conversations that aren't care-based, right? So you have the ability to, to spark conversations about artwork or experiences. And I think some of the really heartwarming stories that we hear are when people recover memories just based on looking at a painting and they may surprise their caregiver or it just gives a bit of a, a almost a recharge to relationships sometimes. I think you're absolutely right. And what I like to think of it is non therapeutic activities that have a therapeutic outcome. And we do a lot of work with lots of different types of clinicians, occupational therapists, like you say, carers. Um, as well and they all articulate the same thing that you can actually get often the same or better therapeutic outcomes from non-clinical activities that are creative like handling objects or viewing art or having a conversation in a social atmosphere about an artwork um, or creating your own art um, that brings about those really brilliant outcomes but actually the sorts of work we've been doing is trying to tease that out more. What are those therapeutic outcomes in relation to those non-clinical activities? Because certainly I think from the caregiver's perspective, whether it's somebody more clinical, whether it's a family member, or whether it's a participant themselves thinking about their own journey of recovery or their own health or well-being, it's what we can tap into in the sorts of programs and activities that we're offering that could really bring about those therapeutic outcomes. So I'm thinking about things like the hand-eye coordination, the sorts of cognitive stimulation that we know we get from those sorts of dementia type activities you've been talking about. And mm -hmm. uh, that's what really excites me about the way that museums have such amazing assets and can really make a, an active contribution to society. And, and we know that they do do that, but I think there's lots of great opportunities around that. And you've talked a bit about the prescribing angle. And I think that's a really fantastic opportunity where we can really offer something very special and really quite unique, which many other community organizations maybe don't have to offer. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was really a pleasure to participate in that pilot. We're waiting on the, the findings, but that was also with other colleagues across the city even. So the ROM, TSO, or Toronto Symphony Orchestra. Um, and it's a bit newer for us because uh, we know that it's been established in the UK, but definitely something we're, we're keen to explore. And I think it's also interesting when I think about the programs that we offer too, um, where we've recently uh, supported, for instance, even bringing doctors in to identify um, museums and art as a way of well-being for them, even not so much based on the Harvard model of uh, kind of diagnostic ability and, and observation skills, but more so identifying the ability to have conversations and we're actually located just down the street from a bunch of hospitals. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting way to think about a space like ours. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for sharing. I'm going to move on to our next question, which is 
how do you feel museums can best support well-being and communities? Yeah, I think it's through a, a range of different ways. I think there's the, we've sort of talked about direct interventions um, and I think there is a lot of opportunity around there. And I think my personal belief is that that should be very much targeted at those people that really need it most. Um, the people that really are excluded, like I say, by virtue perhaps of, of their socioeconomic status, by virtue of their health, perhaps their health um, has declined and therefore that type of intervention could really benefit them. But there's also, I think, the different ways that we operate on a daily basis in our museum spaces and just thinking about the sorts of displays, exhibitions that we're putting together. Uh, people, for example, have looked at doing different trails to get people moving more actively around spaces that um, en enable participants to really get involved in all aspects of the museum, both the indoor space and the outdoor space. Um, and also, I think the way that we support um, and have well-being run through the entire strategy of the museum, and that's certainly through the Alliance, that's the sort of work we've been doing, thinking about if you're really serious about tackling well-being at an organisational level, you really have to think about it in everybody's job description. And we've got some great examples um, from the UK, and I know you're doing some fantastic work there in Canada, and that idea of thinking about as an organisation, what kind of an organisation do we want to be? And having that sort of moral and ethical imperative of, we've got these amazing collections, some of them world standard, and that our moral imperative is, I think, to provide access to those collections to the widest and broadest groups available in your community so that they don't feel excluded. But in order to do that, and I think you can, as we've seen, have really fantastic wellbeing outcomes. But what I've seen is you do need to have a whole organisational commitment for that. And we've got examples in the UK where we've got big national or groups of regional museums that have done that right through to very, very small local museums where at an organisational level, often getting the director and the board of trustees involved in that sort of decision making, making that decision to embed well-being in everybody's work. And that can sometimes mean quite radical shifts. So, you know, I've done a lot of work with the Manchester Museums, the Whitworth Art Gallery, Tyne and Weir, which is in the northeast, a whole series of 12 museums. And they, as organisations with multiple museums and multiple sites, took the decision to embed well-being and make community provision their core function. And what they did is rewrote the entire organisation's job descriptions. Um, those are quite radical, bold moves, but we've seen amazing changes. Both those museums have benefited, they've had uplifts in funding, but also the nature of the engagements that they've had and how they're valued across the community, both in other organisations, say within regional bodies, local authorities, also nationally, being recognised nationally, and in the community organisations that want to work with them. Um, really tackling complex societal issues like addiction recovery, um, inequalities in relation to health, inequalities in relation to employment. Um, and that I think has really changed the face of how those museums and how museums generally are viewed as not just nice to have for a few elite people, but actually a core function in society. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more because I think that also sets us up to be so much more relevant as a cultural organization because we're not only representing that culture in the communities around us but we're shifting and making change with the folks we partner with and that's so key i think not only in my role but in our public and program public programming and learning department um, because we touch so much um, out towards the community to try and make sure that we create space and and uh, i think we can just keep working on that and and do better so my next question for you, which will help with that kind of thinking, is what is the future of well-being and museums? Well, I think, again, there's, there's the sort of structural answer to that, which is through things like social prescribing as they come through, as we start seeing changes to health systems, uh, as you know, we're really seeing that here in the UK. It, it's now a mandate that all GPs can and should be prescribing people for social prescriptions. Uh, and indeed, across the healthcare profession, there's whole organisations that we're linked to, the National Academy for Social Prescribing, and their imperative is around embedding social prescribing across the UK 
health and social care and community public health systems. That's no mean feat, but actually what we're really seeing is museums are often much more um, ready to take that challenge and much better placed often because they they have the ability, like you've talked about the fantastic programmes that you set up, you already have those links into some of those networks and organisations. Because unfortunately, the way that our Western healthcare medicine works is they're very systems focused. You know, it's a visit to the GP or it's a referral into a hospital or it's a referral as an outpatient. Um, and actually com public health problems are much more complex than that. As we know from the work of people like Michael Marmot, that we know that these complex health challenges that people have that are often a combination of physical and psychological for the people who are the most unwell, that you need therefore more public community-based solutions to those health challenges. And as we've talked about, we know that museums can offer that, um, not just in terms of a, a non-clinical therapeutic intervention, but also by creating these community spaces um, so I think there's the health systems approach, you're, you're already having those links in with some of your partners and I think there'll be more opportunities around that. But I think it's also about those wider kind of community public health areas and, and that really comes to the other sorts of partnerships. Again, I know you're doing brilliant work in this where you're linking up with other sorts of community partners. It might be a particular charity or an NGO um, or an organisation dedicated to supporting, say, carers or tackling loneliness um, or an arts or community centre that's very embedded within a particular part of the community. But I think that way you can really get to some of the nub of what the problems are in terms of community public health, which is the mass inequalities that we see. And, you know, we've, we've seen that highlighted through the COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen it highlighted recently through Black Lives Matter. And I think that gives us a really great opportunity to think strategically and practically how we are all as individuals and as organisations going to tackle those problems. And again, I think museums have a great role to play in that and to be really, if you like, revalued and repurposed as organisations that can genuinely help to tackle inequalities at all levels. And that will really help to support improved wellbeing for the people who need it most. So it might not be a cure going to a museum for a particular um, ailment or illness, but it's definitely going to improve people's lives if we can put the systems in place which you've started. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's so incredible to me to see how rewarding that work can be when you partner in a way that you're willing to co-create. And it's about advocating for that community group within, you know, we are a system as well, right? So we are an infrastructure. So being able to identify um, how we're able to work together and create something that's that hits all of our needs, right? And, and that's so relational and it's so based on each each experience and that's for me is what's deeply interesting about this work because it always is a learning experience it's always a moment where you almost identify the museum AGO as a site too for people to use for their own needs mm -hmm. and I think that's also become something that I've just noticed um, also with our new access plan where we've shifted how people are able to come to the gallery so that you get a pass um, for $30, you can visit all year round. If you're 25 and under, you get in for free, but it's shifted our audience so dramatically. And it's also shown how the museum can become almost like a lounge space, a space where you meet people and seeing that vibe and that buzz and how people interact with one another and build community in the museum is so heartening to me because you know we're shifting further and further away from this perception of it being this kind of hallowed temple where it should be something that's produced with the community that's around it well that's what i loved hearing about your program was that co-production and co-developing that program was built in from the start i mean you've got no idea how many programs I've been worked with or know about or people have contacted us about over the years and you'd be so surprised many of them have never thought to ask participants themselves what it is they would like in the program and that's um, what's great about museums is they do have all this expertise about engagement and about designing really engaging active programs but that critical element of asking a participant it's surprising how few organizations do that so it's really brilliant to hear that you've built that in right from the start and I think it really helps 
create, co-create these wonderfully engaging programs that are actually tailored to individual needs rather than us thinking, well, I've got 20 years experience as a learning officer, so I will offer this program, which I've seen a lot of. Um, and when you just ask participants and give them experimental approaches to, you know, we could do a bit of this, we can do a bit of that, let's try some of these activities. They can actually design their own program very effectively. And of course, it will be different from group to group, individual to individual. And having that opportunity to be flexible within the program is just brilliant. So I loved hearing about your program in, in the way that you'd genuinely co-produced it together. Yeah, thank you. It, it was a really, um, that's how I just want to approach work now, because I think I also liken it to the fact that when you um, study art history, which I have, often when you're in front of an artwork, you might go to that kind of background information that you have. And that was what drove me to be so interested in having conversations and, and engaging with people because the multiple perspectives that people can come up with based on just one single work of art can really um, just change your perspective in such an important way. Speaking of perspectives and engagement and co-creation, I also just wanted to remind everyone that we have uh, the ability to take questions from the folks that are watching. So please feel free to put those into the chat so that um, in a little bit, I can also pose them to Helen. Um, I actually have another question for you as well. Um, what is your favorite experience that's promoted health and well-being in a museum? That's so tricky. I mean, <laughs> I, my, my favorite experiences have been the ones that actually contain quite a mix of activities. So um, the programs that I worked with uh, are something called the Beanie House of Art and Knowledge. It was a very small, what we would call a local authority, a locally, uh, you know, an authority run museum in a small town called Canterbury um, in, the, in Kent in the southeast of England. And um, they were part of a, a research project that we uh, put together testing the value and impact of developing a social prescribing scheme. So it was called Museums on Prescription. Um, and they put together a whole program focused around craft and making because there'd, there'd been a big history of that in the town. Um, and the participants were super creative. And what the reason I really loved it is lots of museums do craft and knitting and making activities was that what it did through the program was a spin out, which I think is a really important thing to think about when you're putting programs together, which is we often talk about programs and projects and activities and interventions as very short term. And when we, the sorts of work we've been doing with museums, what we found is you do see really great immediate and some short term benefits from that sort of engagement. But if you genuinely want to see changes in the way people um, are living their lives, if you want to see behavior changes and you want to see lifestyle changes that then lead to improvements in health and well-being, that you need to have sustained engagement. Mm -hmm. And so what they did is they then created spin out groups. So they then set up an every day uh, and every Tuesday knitting club. And then another day they set up an art making club. So it wasn't even the activities that they were doing that were so um, different. It was more the fact that they then led those to create these spin out groups to ensure that there was a legacy. So our particular museums on prescription program was only 10 weeks, but it meant that all those participants had something to go on to at the end and they could join multiple groups. And then I guess my other one is at the Whitworth Art Gallery. Again, at the time, nobody else was really doing much around this, but using the collections for mild mindfulness and meditation. Uh, and that combined both actual meditation in the gallery inspired by images, but also a lot of very, very close looking, uh, really beautiful textiles and prints and other artworks um, to think about mindfulness in a different way. And again, that's become very popular in the UK. I'm guessing it's popular in Canada as well. Um, oh, yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because I think most people don't know that when you're kind of walking past an object or an artwork, we often spend only three to 10 seconds looking at that. And not to say that we don't have the visual ability to take that, that information, but I, it's so interesting to me that, you know, by just standing somewhere and having someone kind of guide your looking, how much more you can get from that work and how much more impactful it is. You almost feel your body relaxing, too. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's definitely a, a, a trend I super appreciate and, and love seeing. 
And those guys, what, what they did is um, they had lots of separate programs. And now what they've done is create a program. It's called the Grow Program. Um, and it uses their outdoor space and connects it with the indoor space. So the theme is sort of nature. So they do outdoor horticultural activities in the park, growing. Um, and then they use the collections that, um, that have that featured nature in some way. So it could be beautiful artworks. It could be something like Frida Kahlo with some beautiful plants in it. Um, and then they do art viewing, art making, art handling, craft activities inspired by nature. So they have a whole theme running through it. And I really like that idea uh, of having the connection with collections and indoor spaces along with the outdoor spaces. And what's been brilliant about that program is the way that they've then weaved in some like really big topical issues like um, climate change issues and environmental degradation to thinking about why it's important to grow, why it's important uh, to have good quality natural environments and why art can help connect and raise awareness of those challenges to do with, for example, environmental degradation. Um, and participants, I think, found that really inspiring. And that's, again, um, been a way to keep those participants engaged in activities. So rather than feeling kind of doom and gloom about, oh, no, more information about climate change, actually thinking, well, actually being outdoors, growing plants, being part of a, a community where you can see, you know, a wonderful garden growing has made such a difference. And then going and reflecting that through um, active reflection with the collections and thinking about how that's reflected through art and culture has, has really helped people engage, I think, in another way with these very sort of big global issues, but in a quite a productive way. And, and that's been they do that work with people with um, often quite severe mental health problems and also a lot of people who are homeless. Mm -hmm. um, so who might be living in the park um, or have lived in the park at some point. So building a different relationship with the spaces that they're, they live in. I love that. I think that that's so incredible because you're also breaking down the barriers between the museum and the outside. And I just also think for us at the AGO, we have this beautiful park out in the back of the building too that we just redesigned. And that's such a fabulous space that we're excited to start programming mm -hmm. for and including. And I do know that some of our gallery guides uh, do take their tours out to look at our Henry Moore sculpture in the back as well. So I think it's always a surprise for visitors to say, oh, look, look, this is also part of how we can engage with culture and space. Um, so I have a question that I'd love to share um, with you that we've received from one of our uh, viewers. So many museums have not changed facilities to meet needs of elder visitors or any physically um, challenged visitors. The majority of AGO washrooms are designed for much younger users, which is true. Besides programming, what have your museums been able to do to ensure the full space is welcoming? Great question. I think that's a really important question. And when I talked about entire organizational support for well-being, I mean investing in the buildings. So for example, you know, the Whitworth Art Gallery was a, a big old Victorian museum art gallery space that was really not set up for, you know, it didn't have disabled access properly. It was compliant, but not really um, that accessible for, for blind or partially sighted people, for wheelchair users, it was complicated. So again, when they took the organizational decision to embed wellbeing, what they did is a lot of consultation with all the sorts of different audiences that you want to work with. Um, and again, this sounds really obvious, but it's surprising how few people museums do it is, um, get those audiences in and, and ask them what their challenges were um, with accessing the space. And it does involve, I think, uh, injections of cash to tackle the physical infrastructure of the building, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, museums don't want to hear that, but I think it really does. And, and the same goes, you know, whether it's, say, tackling, you know, services for blind or partially sighted people, people who are deaf. It's really only by engaging those participants, isn't it, that I guess you're going to know you know what the challenges are that they're facing and how you might be able to adapt to not just your programs but also your actual space yeah and that's also really interesting when we've co-created programs previously where we've had um sometimes the organizations come and do a site visit because we are challenged with some of those infrastructural <laughs> um obstacles and so that's key too to just explain the site and what you know, you have on offer to be able to mitigate some of those things that can't be fixed immediately. Mm. Great answer, thank you. We have another one that's very apropos for right now. How can you connect care and how it intersects with race? 
Yeah, I mean, that is very current, isn't it? I mean, I guess the same has been in Canada, but in the UK, for example, such in terms of COVID, but that's just one example. We know the same is if you look again at all the inequalities research that's been done over many decades now, we know that there is an inequalities issue around BAME communities. Um, and again, that's where I think museums have a really important role to play. I, I, we talked about the moral imperative before. I think all community organisations um, and certainly any government organisations that are funded, that should be their priority is thinking about th those inequalities that BAME communities face. Every aspect of society should be looking at, at what are the challenges. It could be barriers to participation. We've talked about that a little bit with museums. I mean, um, a lot of it is piecemeal. A lot of it has been because these are complex and challenging issues. But I, as far as I can see, the only way is to have open dialogue and, and getting participants involved in a co-production way. You know, who is it that decides on displays in museums and what gets exhibited? Who is it that decides what how labels get written? Um, you know, at the minute. There are examples of exhibitions and displays that get co-produced in, in that way, but it's, it's rare, let's be honest, most museums and galleries that are exhibiting work, the, the work is represented by a certain, um, you know, people who've written labels, who've designed the exhibitions, who haven't necessarily consulted with wider communities. I think there's also, uh, Melissa, we talked a little bit about this, about the links. Obviously, I'm from a university's background, so I'm very conscious of the links between museums and education. And again, there's been inroads, museums working more with schools and more working more with universities. But that issue of why BAME communities in many areas, not in all areas, but don't flourish as well in school environments, don't flourish, haven't got the same opportunities to go into higher education. Again, I think museums can step in there. They can provide access routes, they can provide programmes, they can provide routes in to engage with BAME communities to support that kind of learning and skills. And we know, again, from a wellbeing aspect, that's a really, really important area about wellbeing that you see massive improvements in individuals' health and wellbeing the greater their educational status. That doesn't necessarily mean levels at qualification levels. There is a direct correlation with their education levels, but it's actually more about opportunities for learning. So again, museums are set up as learning institutions in many situations. So again, it's about having those, those active connections with BAME communities so that they are able to actively participate and thinking about you know, which some museums um, do, I know, having specific programmes tailored to, for example, looking at aspects of the collections that could be, you know, we talk a lot about decolonisation and that's a big topic in education, but also in museums thinking about how that connects with education and curriculum. That could be in an informal way. So that could be through the sorts of programmes that you're offering. Yeah, and I think just because you're using the term BAME community, um, I, I think we're getting a sense of what that is, but can you define that a little bit more for us too? Yeah, I mean, in, well, in the UK, we use that mm -hmm. to describe all communities who are black ethnic minority communities. Um, and just using the word community implies like, a, you know, a, uh, that there's some sort of cohesive, you know, unit. But what we're talking about is, for me, it's any individual I think we ought to be thinking about inequalities. We know that black and ethnic minorities in the UK, I'm guessing the data is the same in Canada and the rest of North America, I'm sure, um, that those communities face the worst health inequalities. Um, they live in environments that are depleted of, of what we're talking about here, community assets. They don't have museums and art galleries on their doorsteps. They might not have libraries. Um, they're people who are struggling every day with issues around employment. Um, and so again, um, you, those might not be the individuals or communities on the museum's doorstep, but I think there is a moral imperative for museums and other community organisations to be thinking about how you can reach out to those audiences that are not engaging. So that, I, I think, um, there, and there are museums that have specific programmes, I know, designed to do that, working with black and ethnic minority groups. Um, in the UK, we ha that's been a big driver for a lot of museum work. I work with a group, they're really brilliant, called Museum Detox. And they're a group of, <laughs> of museum, I don't know if you've come across them, they're a group of yeah. museum professionals who are all from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. And what they're doing is they go and work across 
uh, museums at an institutional level, at a training level, and thinking about university and school education, thinking about how the museum sector can be, yes, less toxic, <laughs> um, and how it can be more inclusive. Yeah, and I think that that's a big challenge because as a system and a structure, it's, it is from a colonial perspective of the world. So, and that's why for me, I think being able to engage with communities, um, we're able to undo that. And I think we're so on the cusp of making that happen. Um, and to me, really the imperative, as you've said, is that if it had, if visiting a museum, having a conversation, making art, having a creative moment, impacts your health and well-being, um, then we need to be broadcasting that. Mm. And that's also why museums and cultural sites are a human right and why we need to provide access uh, because it is such an incredible thing to see people come together and talk about really incredibly important issues. Um, and that can be launched by an object, that can be launched mm. by an artwork. And you can shift a perspective. And we've seen that quite a bit in some of the exhibitions um, we've produced. I'm just thinking also um, lately about when we, we engaged with um, the Anthropocene um, by Ed Bertinsky, um, where he really addressed climate change. And we were able to evaluate, too, how people shifted in that moment. So yeah, it's, it's a very, um, very important thing, I think, yeah. that we need to, to share. How do you engage with audiences around health and well-being who may not be informed about the colonial and harmful histories of museums? Mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, again, there's some, some lovely examples from Canada. I've just been doing some work with colleagues at National Museums Kenya, and um, there I'm sort of thinking about the, the more holistic uh, idea of what well-being is. So, for example, they've been working with Indigenous communities who live um, in forests, and these forests are just um, as well as home to those individuals, the humans, they live alongside these um, plants and um, animals, the wildlife that are completely endemic to those forests. So you can't find them anywhere else in Kenya. And there's 12 different sites, 12 different indigenous communities. And um, one of the curators there, I think, had been having a relationship for a long time with those indigenous communities because of the, the endemic nature of the wildlife there and how special the wildlife was. But those communities are really, as we know, with many indigenous communities, they face a lot of challenges in terms of, you know, how they're, they're represented. In, in both nationally but also regionally, their voice, the fact that they have a lack of voice, you know, they have also many economic challenges and very specific health challenges. But um, their, their biggest sense was they need to stay connected to their land and without having protected status of the forest, um, they found that very difficult. You know, there was issues with being evicted from the land and that's obviously been a big contentious history for, for many uh, of our um, particular geographic areas that we're currently talking about, Canada, across North America, I work a lot with Australia, but it's, it's everywhere. And it was really interesting. I mean, it took them a long time to do this, but basically the museum helped them get UNESCO protection. Um, and that providing that sort of the institutional support for those indigenous communities who didn't have the agency, they certainly didn't have the financial or legal backing to be able to get that sort of protection. But in order, by getting that UNESCO protection, it actually caused um, the government to make much more of an investment and value in those forests. So although they had supposed national protection, they were still having massive problems, both the, the human communities that live there, but also that wildlife uh, that lives there. And so uh, I guess I really like that idea of the way that museums, there are lots of smaller local examples of that. Um, and I know that there's, that's been something that many Canadian museums are looking for in terms of First Nations. But I think also that idea that how museums could be playing this role in stepping in as, as brokers. Um, and I, I think, yeah, that the challenge of how you do that. I mean, some really great lessons that can be learned from how you can engage with those uh, communities to find out what is actually matters to them because it might be slightly different. So all that, although that was initially tied to a kind of ethical and human rights and a health issue, actually by getting the forest protected, it's made a big difference to those communities and actually has seen channels of money going in that wouldn't have gone in before. 
yeah if that answers that question but um. no well I mean it's it's challenging because just the the very nature of museums are connected to that um past and so how do we move forward and I think that it is in consultation with communities and it's about trying to leverage um, maybe the bureaucratic language that uh, is sometimes prevalent in our sites to be able to make that shift and change. Um, and that's what's so key about being that kind of social determinant of health. Mm -hmm. and, and, and having representation in your staffing, I mean, that is crucial. It links to the education point because, it, yeah, of course, you need the right level of expertise. But then if you're excluded from the mechanisms for getting those expertise, so we need to have different routes. You know, mm -hmm. I've always said, do you, I haven't got a museum studies qualification. Do you need a museum studies qualification to work in museums? I personally don't think you do. I think you need to know about the stuff you're looking after. Well, there's different types of knowledge for for <laughs> for what what that stuff is, isn't there? So um, there's different now, view, different ways to think about how you people the, uh, the and staff your museum. I think that's an incredibly important point. And as a museum studies person, I mean, I definitely did like the degree, but certainly there's an appetite, I think, across the field for having multiple perspectives and backgrounds present. I can just even think of a colleague at the ROM, Christian Blake, who has a background in occupational therapy. So that brings a really interesting um, lens to the work that you do then on site, right? Because it is so based and again, another health and well-being perspective. Um, I think we're coming near the end of our chat today, but I also just wanted to take a moment to share from one of your incredible studies about what we know um, to be the evidence of how engaging and museums provide health and well-being. So do you mind if I read that to you? Because I think it's actually just great. So evidence shows that engaging with museums provides positive social experiences, reducing social isolation, opportunities for learning and acquiring new skills, calming experiences, leading to decreased anxiety, increased positive emotions, such as optimism, hope, and enjoyment, increased self-esteem and sense of identity, increased inspiration and opportunities for meaning making, positive distraction from clinical environments, including hospitals and care homes, and increased communication among families, caregivers, and health professionals. I mean, it's so phenomenal that we're able to demonstrate that that's the impact um, of these sites. And I think it's really important to consider how we're able to just further that impact. Well, congratulations on your programs. I, I really wish you luck with them. And I look forward to staying connected to hear how you're getting on. And it'd be lovely to have more connections. I, I met lots of lovely colleagues last year at the Alberta Museums Association Conference. And I think you're doing really fantastic work there over in Canada. So I look forward to hearing more about it. Well, thank you, Helen. It's just been a real pleasure to speak with you. I have been joking with my colleagues that I was just going to turn bright red because it's been so exciting to read all of your scholarship around this point. And it's definitely a wonderful lens to uh, apply to how we pursue our, our roles and, and, and a call to action really to improve how we engage with our communities as a site. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> yes. So I hope everything goes well in the UK. I know that you're more open than we are currently, but we're looking to catch up. Um, and so I hope you have a really wonderful rest of your summer. Thank you. And good luck with your museum openings as and when they happen. Ours, I think, are going to be slow, but <laughs> hopefully are starting soon. I think there's a big appetite for the, for the sector to get open again. So best of luck to you guys as well. Thank you so much, Helen, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Lovely to meet you all. Bye.